I'm here at the San Antonio Zoo, dying of heat exhaustion, to talk to you about these guys. Specifically, how they relate to one of our biggest problems in science. Let's start from the beginning. There's a replication crisis among scientists, and it's serious. Several scientific fields have done major replication attempts, and they just aren't getting the same results the second time around. And this isn't a case of an odd finding here or there. No, we're having to question foundational studies in the literature of psychology, biomedicine, and while the harder scientists might be smugly chuckling right now about their epistemic superiority, many wonder if they're not a big replication attempt away from the same situation. In short, the replication crisis is a serious problem, and not just for scientists. Remember, what happens in science becomes public policy. What happens in science becomes your drug treatment. What happens in science turns into pop science, which turns into your friend insisting at a dinner party that power posing is the secret to becoming dominant and assertive. There's nothing there. The books have nothing to say. We all have a vested interest in science getting it right, or at least correcting itself when it's wrong. But what's so terrifying about the replication crisis isn't that we got a few things wrong, it's that we didn't notice they were wrong for so long. The explanations for the replication crisis are varied. A few simply deny there is a problem. Others propose that our standards for statistical significance are too weak. P-values, they would say, breeds too many false positives and have helped create the crisis. Some say we don't incentivize replication enough. Some say the gatekeeping institutions are to blame, and the culprit list goes on and on. And I think most of these have some truth to them, but I want to talk about a much simpler theory for the replication crisis. A theory that begins with us looking at giraffes. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Not this exact giraffe, of course, but the process that led us to this exact giraffe. Natural selection is the process where organisms better adapted to an environment tend to survive and reproduce. And giraffes are an archetype of natural selection. The ones with longer necks were better able to eat tree leaves and reproduce, and over time you get this. But the scientist Dr. Paul Smaldino argues that this same process affects more than just animals. So if you can imagine, we're used to thinking of evolution in terms of acting on genes and on biological species that die and reproduce. But culture also evolves, right? And you know, Darwin laid out, you don't need genes for evolution. There are just, you just need three things, right? You need variation in a population. You need the things that vary to be heritable, to be able to be passed down from one individual to another. And you need selection. So that variation matters in the extent to which those traits are passed down. And anything that has those properties is subject to natural selection. Anything including science. So scientists vary in their methods. There is heritability in which, you know, different methods get passed down. So uh, students have advisors who they learn from, uh, professors who have influence, they spread their methods through their papers, through their seminars, through their lectures and there's selection. There's a lot more people who get PhDs in the sciences who want jobs than can have them. And that, there's, so there's a bottleneck. And selection through the bottleneck is non-random, right? And there's, you know, so the question is then, what are the traits that we're selecting for? In theory, we're selecting for truth, but it's hard to know what's true. So we've tended to use publications in journals as a proxy. So what we actually select for in practice are as many publications as possible in the best journals possible. Which Smaldino admits sounds good. You know, we want to hire scientists who are productive, who do a lot of, who, you know, actually produce work. We want to hire scientists whose work is impactful, that gets cited a lot, gets, you know, is important enough to be in high impact journals and get press coverage. The issue is that if we use the measure of how many papers, the impact of those of the journals that are published in, how many grants, right? These are proxies and proxies can be gamed. Proxies can not only be gamed, they will be gamed. This is something called Goodhart's Law in economics. I'm going to demonstrate how. Let's say you have a gold mine and we'll put it on Science Mountain. 
Now, normally, the miners just look for gold and sell it to merchants. But unfortunately, there are limited mines on Science Mountain. So to make sure you have the most productive miners, you think it's a good idea to measure productivity. So you tell miners, the ones who sell the most gold every year keep their jobs and get promoted. Fair enough. But there's a small problem on Science Mountain. Gold is rare, but there's also fool's gold, which is less rare. Fool's gold looks like gold, it feels like gold, but it's not gold. And as the owner of the mine, you don't want fool's gold. It ruins your reputation long term. Now, we'd hope that merchants would be really good at spotting fool's gold. They wouldn't buy it, so to speak. So that would keep everything in check. But we find that that's not the case. Science Mountain's fool's gold, it's really hard to spot. And the merchants aren't that good at telling the difference. The only people who are really experts are the miners who specialize in that mine. But now you've given them every incentive to work fast and ask questions later. It's not hard to see that given that situation, in a very short amount of time, you'd flood the market with fool's gold. Because whatever could be found and polished up and sent off as gold would be. Meanwhile, your scrupulous miners, the ones who took their time and made sure only to sell real gold, would be fired for not being productive enough. This is Goodhart's law at work. You picked a measure of productivity, made it a target, and inadvertently made all your miners less productive. Your miners are busy filling quotas to try to keep their job instead of making sure what they're mining is really gold. Now this of course is more than a simple analogy. This is the situation with real science. Journals are not good at catching false positives. So when you make publication numbers and citations the measure of a scientist, and what gets published are sensational results, you might think you're selecting for more true, exciting science, but you're not. You're just gonna end up with a lot of exciting science that appears true, but may in fact be built on nothing. And it doesn't help that although we pay lip service to replication, we don't give scientists much incentive to replicate old studies, which means that once an untruth gets into our scientific literature, it's really hard for us to dig it back out. Because of the publish or perish mentality, we are currently facing an impossible amount of scientific articles. The well-respected The Lancet researched that a while ago, and they found that 85% of the published biomedical research is rubbish, nonsense. If you throw in enough data and you give it a good scientific stir, you'd be a complete idiot if you don't find any correlation between something and something else. And then you're published, and your H index goes up, and that, my dear scientists of the future, is a good thing. Not for society, not, not, not for the world, but for you. What is good for a scientist's career isn't good for science. That is at the heart of Smaldino's critique. But he goes a step further and says, look, this isn't an individual problem. This isn't a matter of some bad scientists ruining it for the rest. Natural selection doesn't require conscious strategizing. And here's where our giraffe example is once again useful. No individual giraffe conspired to get a longer neck. In the same way, no scientist even needs to be aware of the system in order for the replication crisis to happen. This is a problem that Smaldino thinks a lot of people miss. If the incentives are still there, then over time, everyone can still have the, you know, perfectly good intentions and say, I'm going to do my best, but the people whose best involves doing, let's say, less rigorous work and getting more papers out, doing uh, less rigorous work and uh, overhyping their results or interpreting it in ways that, let's say, are less have less integrity, but you know, get the headline. They're going to get rewarded. They're going to get the better jobs. They're going to get more grants. They're going to attract more students. Their students are going to copy their methods. And those methods are gonna propagate that lead to uh, worse results, more false positives, more false discoveries, less reproducibility. And the problems don't stop there. It's not just about bad research being able to thrive. Having a constant supply of so-called groundbreaking studies also devalues what we think of as true in science. Consider that in the last 40 years, words like innovative, groundbreaking, and novel in PubMed journal abstracts have increased by 2,500%. Now one would hope that scientists have gotten that much more innovative in 40 years, but that seems unlikely. 
Instead, it seems indicative of an ever-increasing pressure on scientists to be pumping out more and more papers every year to be able to compete with their colleagues so they don't lose their spot on Science Mountain. And in that environment, the scientists who choose to do deep, slow, rigorous work fall farther and farther behind. You might have heard of Peter Higgs. He won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2013 for predicting the Higgs boson. But what you might not appreciate is that that piece of great science took Peter Higgs a very long time. It took him five years of publishing nothing, just working on this one problem in order to publish the paper that he would eventually get the Nobel Prize for. In an interview, Peter Higgs said he couldn't do that work today. He'd never be hired. He says he isn't productive enough by today's standards. And to do deep work also, requires some removal, right? If you want to do really deep, interesting, unique work, right? Who are, if you, and this is true of any field, not just science, but art and, you know, literature, anything that involves creation, right? The people who are going to be doing the things that are the most unique and potentially groundbreaking are probably not the people who are always moving and hustling and, you know, in the limelight. It's going to be people who, at least sometimes take time and go away for a while and work in a concentrated way on what they're doing. And if you never have the time and the space to do that, if the people who need the time and the space to do that are never given the opportunity to do that, you know, what, what does that mean for the landscape of research? You know, the kinds of research that we see and that gets done. It's, it's not obvious how to solve this problem but I, it's, it's, I think it's an important thing to consider. Wait, 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 wait. We can't end it like that. We haven't even talked about solutions and we are about to fix that. We will talk about solutions to these very big, very real problems in science. But first we're gonna talk about a much simpler solution to a big problem, which is your website. So thank you to our sponsor today, Squarespace. Bad joke, but great website builder. Uh, Squarespace is your all-in-one stop for any kind of website you want to build. Now, I know I talked in the last video about how it's super customizable, but really easy to use and surprisingly a deep product. But what I wanna focus on today is how fast it loads. Now, they use progressive image loading, which means that when someone goes onto your site, normally, if you build a website yourself, your images probably all try to load at the same time. It's slow, progressive image loading, loads the top images first so your website is very snappy. We all know that snappy websites are the king. You don't wanna get that back button we've all clicked before because a website's not loading. You don't want that to happen on your website. So Squarespace, it solves all these things for you so you don't have to spend time worrying about them. So if you want to go check it out, it's a 14 day free trial. You can build the website, try all the little features, and then when you're sure that it does everything that you want it to do, you can go to checkout and use promo code Coffee Break for 10% off your first domain or website. Once again, that's promo code Coffee Break for 10% off your first website or domain. Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's talk about much more complicated solutions. How do we fix these problems in science? So I put two full interviews together with two really smart scientists all about this. One is Dr. Smaldino, you've seen him before. And number two is Dr. Brian Nosek, super brilliant. You're gonna get a lot out of that conversation, but if you just want a little, little taste Here's a little teaser for those two interviews. Thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting the channel. And I will see you guys next time. So let me be clear, like science is, science is this great process. And I, it is like the best way to discover truth. And the notion that replication is boring is demonstrably false. There's you know, some nice game theory modeling showing that a lottery would actually be a really uh, good use of the scientist's time. The best intervention uh, that we have so far that's realigning the incentives is register reports.